Uh, we've covered the parasha well, and we've not begun to scratch the surface because it is, I like that cornucopia, it is so much, so much in it. And just by way of reference, sorry, I'm trying to get that out of my eyesight and yet not hurt my ear. Um, if you've been with me, may I have a word with you? <laughs> Words to remember. Because it's the, heart, the, matter, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And we, oh my goodness, how this is just building and building and building. And when we begin to see the overall and yet the detail, that's when we're really beginning to come into the, the fullness of it. And the, the thrust, the whole thrust of this parsha is active. It's an active form of obedience. You can't sit still with this one. If you are, you're not in it. Because you should be heeding his judgments. You should be listening to the commandments. But more than just shma, is obedience, is taking action. And God gave them such a wonderful promise that if they did this, they would prosper. None of these diseases would come on them. They would have blessings. They would live in the promised land, and they'd live in that land in victory. Now, who wouldn't want all of that? That's just, I mean, if somebody's dangling that carrot, don't you want to take a bite out of that? Some of our versions start with, and, and uh, Bruce has already talked about it, huh? it says, and if you listen to these rules and these commandments, others say, and because you listen, and they argue, our rabbis like to argue, <laughs> but really I think the latter is a little more definitive in accuracy because it's affirming that the obedience leads to the blessings. It's not just the hearing, it is the acting. And even as Bruce said that his banner, he put over and said, with love, and while that's beautiful, I'm still going to say it's even more than that. The whole banner is love. So these little words do matter. We see differences, and it's not that one's right and one's wrong, but we want that whole picture. And when we look at that Hebrew word, akev, or akev, when we go back to the root, it literally comes from the root of cough, and it literally means heal. And we're familiar with it when we know the correct definition of the name Yaakov, Jacob. It is not supplanter. It is not a negative. The true meaning of his name is heal grasper. And that's what he was doing. He was grasping the heel of his brother when he came out of the womb, and that's how he got named. Often the names were based on something like that. Esau got named Esau because he was hairy and red, and that's what the root of that means. But when we look at that, when we look at that meaning and we bring it into what's being said today, the way it's explained is, and it shall be when your heel is ready to take a step, listen with your whole heart. Do you see how everything is involved? Your mind, your soul, your body, it's not leaving any part out. It's a wholeness. Remember last week, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your might. It covers every area. And the way I look at this, this word and this heal, and forgive me, but it's just in my little simplistic mind, I look at a puppy dog. I look at a dog who loves his master, and he's hanging on what his master wants. He's just ready and waiting. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? And as soon as the master says, heal, he's right there, right at his master's side, and he's taking off with his master right at his heel. That's how I see this word. We are so anxious. We're ready to hear. We're tuned in to hear the voice of our master. We want to please him. We want the action. We want to take that step forward. We want to take that step of faith. We want to jump in with both our feet. And before this partial is over, I cannot begin to cover all that's in it. Before it's over, we've got Abraham and Sarah as an example, who by faith believed they have a son. But I'll take it back further than that because Abraham had to put a foot to the promise. He had to take that step. He was going to the land that God showed him? Uh-uh. That God said, here it is on the map? Uh-uh. That God gave him directions to get there? Uh-uh. God said, go. 
And thankfully, Avraham didn't say no. And he went. He stepped forward. He took action, and our rabbis bring it home, and they say Avraham heard the word down to his heel. To God. Whole body. Whole body. Our parasha goes through the litany of our history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all there. But it's necessary because they had to realize that they're making choices and those choices matter. And repetitiveness helps us learn. So yes, he brings it out and he reminds them that they should learn from the past, but they should move looking forward. And God says, I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to bring you in and there's seven enemies in that land. You'd think one would be enough. <laughs> he says, there's seven. But he says, no fear. And I want to put that in capital letters. No fear. Really? You just told me there's seven that want to come at me. And I think Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, you know, we can keep counting. It hasn't changed that God has said, no fear. And then he gave them a good reason not to fear. He said, remember what I did to Pharaoh? Remember about Egypt? What have you got to worry about? I drowned a whole Egyptian army. And I did that after I split a whole Red Sea, sent you across on dry ground. Not one of you got wet. And not one of them got across. Gone. Your seven enemies, gone. And we can apply that. Please take this and apply it as I go on, because I have to just keep reading. <laughs> Dabba ring, Deuteronomy 7, verse 18. You are not to be afraid of them. You shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Verse 21, just three verses later, verse 21. You are not to be terrified of them, because Adonai, the Lord your God, is in your midst. Yes, ma'am. It's not old and antiquated, no. no. A absolutely, absolutely. Isra, I pray you're reading your parasha. I pray you're listening. I pray you have an ear to hear because it is all over what they need for today. Absolutely. There is nothing that, the Shlomo said there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, true, there's nothing new under the sun, but absolutely, is it relevant to today? Is it relevant to your life? When you're taking into the planet, if I ask you around the room, is there any one of you who doesn't have an enemy? Something they're afraid of, something they're struggling with, a hurdle to get over. We all, we live there. What an example to look at Israel, to see what God did for the apple of his eye. To see what God is doing for the apple of his eye. And to know that we've been brought in because when we're in the family that is the body of Messiah, you don't think he's got the same love for his body of, of those who make up this assembly, both Jewish and Gentile today? Oh my goodness, apply it. Let it be alive. This is the living word of God. This is not dead historical facts. This is live. This is alive today. Yes, Jenna. It is new and fresh and alive, and it's got a heartbeat. Yes, yes, and I love it. Those two verses I gave you, verse 18 and verse 21, twice, not to be afraid, not to be terrified. Now let me take you to the Hebrew. Love it, love it, love it. You shall not be afraid of them. Verse 18, afraid is yare. Okay? Yare means to fear. Okay? You're not to fear. Verse 21 literally says, Yahweh, or Adonai, is your God among you, the God great and awesome. Now I love that in English. But in English, awesome is wow, and that's great, that's part. But do you know what the word is in the Hebrew? Yare. Fearful. Our God is a fearful God, and not fearful in the way of panic, oh no, fear. Because he's saying no fear. But it's in a way of seeing how awesome and how amazing. Wow. And if you really can catch just a glimpse of the awesomeness of our God, then your enemies are gone. They are defeated. Your fears are gone. You have nothing to fear because you're in this with him. 
He's there. He's in your midst. And that's what he was telling Ezra. I'm not distant. I'm not away. I'm not unaware. You don't have to inform me. Too many times, God forgive us all. In our prayers, we're informing him. Hello? He knows. <laughs> okay? He knows. Take it there. Because what he is saying is this awesome God, this God who is, is so fearfully wonderful, he's leading you into a great land. He's telling what he's promised them. He says, you know how it gets water? I do it. I water this land. It's not from the Nile River. It's not from another source. I water it. I send the water from heaven. It goes through the channels, from the mountains to the valleys. I water this land. And it's a beautiful land. It is fruitful. There's seven species. And I'll let you read those species rather than me go into them. It tells you all seven that are in there. And then it says, this same awesome God who's made this beautiful land, who waters this land, who makes it fruitful, who's putting you into this land in victory, not in defeat and not in fear, but in victory, this same God, this awesome God. Go to chapter 8, and chapter 8, verse 14 says, I led you out of bondage. This same God, I brought you out of slavery. Stop and think. Slavery, you belong to somebody else. They're getting to call the shots. They're getting to control. And he broke that. And he freed them. He brought them out completely. And then he goes on and says in verse 15, I led you through the great and terrible wilderness where there were fiery serpents, scorpions, drought. Hello, that's not for me. I don't want any part of that. I brought spiders. Oh my. I brought forth water. How did he bring forth the water? Out of the rock. Wow. And you think you, you know, this is no little, I wish I brought a little rock. You know the one that holds this door open? Ah. Do you know he watered two and a half million people? That's a big rock. And that's a lot of water. And their, their cattle, they got water too. And they had enough to cook. They had enough to wash. Because I don't think they were on speaking. He said, I brought forth water for you in the drought. I brought you mom, manna from heaven. I fed you. Anybody who can do that, what do you fear? What can you fear? Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell. You didn't need new sandals. He kept everything for them. This awesome God says, I'm going to go before you like a devouring <coughs> fire. You know what happens when the fire goes through? There's nothing left. That's what he said, I'm going to do to the enemies. I'm going to destroy Amakim, your first enemy. They're going to be gone. And it's not because you're so good you deserve it. It's because they're so wicked. So they're being thrust out. You're being brought in. All you need to do is shmah. Here. All you need to do is obey. Remember, it's he who did it. It's God who did it. It wasn't them. It wasn't up to them. If it's up to me, I'm full of fear because I know I can't do it. But God didn't ever say, you've got to work it up. You've got to do it. You've got to meet it. Here's your problem. Fix it. He's the fixer. So he says, remember all this. Remember, I'm the one who did it. I'm the one who's promised. I'm the one who's with you. I'm the one who is keeping you. So obey me. The commandments I'm giving you are to bring you into obedience with me. And with someone who loves you and takes care of you. That should be easy peasy, right? <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> and we go through the history lesson. What happens? We know disobedience leads to those curses. Obedience leads to those lessons. But we come into what I consider the key verses for this par shot. Held my breath to see if Bruce was going to steal my thunder. <laughs> Let me take you to chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, love him, and to serve on and on your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And right on the hills, that was verse 12, right on the hills is verse 20 that says, you're to fear on and on your God. You're to serve him, 
you're to cling to him, and you're to swear by his name. And what a name Thomas gave us in our songs tonight. Wow. Here's that word fear again. Fear Adonai. Fear the Lord. You're up Adonai in our Hebrew. And as I look at what our classical <coughs> our sages teach us, is that there's three levels of fear. There's the type of fear that you're afraid of unpleasant consequences. You're afraid there's going to be a punishment. So you stay away because you're anticipating pain if you follow through. So you stay away. You flee from it. In that category, often people, because they're afraid of what others are going to think, they'll react in that way. They'll do something to keep from losing somebody's friendship or, or having someone upset at them. There's a fear of rejection is an easy way to put it. Then there's a second level of fear, and that second level is an anxiety over breaking God's law. Now it's not worrying so much about the people, it's worrying about God. And that this idea that God's going to punish me, God's going to judge me, and I'm fearful of that. And so they're living with an anxiety for the moment and for the hereafter. They want to please God. Sometimes that comes out of self-preservation. I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to do it, you know, to please God. But it's still stopping at a certain level. Then you come into the third level. And this third level, the highest kind of fear. Remember, we're looking at what fear means, and it's not I'm afraid, but it's that awesomeness. And when we look at that profound reverence for the life God's given us, for seeing the presence of God in all things in your life, if He's there in your midst, what different perspective will you have on what you're dealing with? This is the awe of the exalted. That's what they call it, the highest level of fear, the awe of the exalted. This is beholding God's glory. This is beholding God's majesty. This is admiration to, to the hilt. This is standing at the Grand Canyon and looking at that and saying, wow, God, the depth, the height, the breadth. This is beginning to get a glimpse of how great, how awesome, how you're up, our God is. And it's very interesting that as you're becoming overwhelmed with his glory, as you're becoming overwhelmed with the beauty that God has created and the beauty of who God is and his relationship with you, his creation, then you take that word Yara and you take, okay, sorry, Yara and the word for see, see, is Ra'a. The only difference is the Yud in front, okay? Just one little mark and that's it. It's the only difference. So these two words are very, very closely related. And when you link it, when you begin to put that into perspective, that awe, that you're beginning to see. Now take it into verb form. And by the way, next parsha is all about seeing. It's all about ra'ah. That's the verb form of ra'ah, which is the noun form, which is seeing in action and seeing as a noun. Because Gabriel 1126, Deuteronomy, next week says, See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. You know, everything that we're reading, we put in chapters and verses and starts and stops. God just poured this out and has been building. That's why I took you back two weeks and said, may I have a word with you? And remember the matter of the heart. And now we're coming into this awesome fear that we're going to see on a level that's no longer physically seen. This is what's happening. God's building it in us. And if we can just allow him to open our eyes, to see with spiritual eyes, to not be dependent on physical senses, but to see this, see our surroundings, 
with spiritual eyes, see our circumstances. Then we begin to realize everything that's happening to us, with us, for us, through us, nothing's trivial. Nothing's there by accident. Nothing is wasted. God is so awesome in the details. It blows my mind because I'm just a speck of dust. I'm one of how many billion? And over how much time? And God's taking care of this whole universe. He's keeping those stars from falling. He's keeping the sun in its elliptical path. And he's in the detail of my life. When I can begin to see that nothing has entered my life by accident. Nothing is there for harm. Everything there is to draw me to the awesomeness of my God. To bring me closer. To get into a close relationship with him now we're perceiving the divine we're, we're no longer seeing common we're seeing the ultimate instead of the simple we're seeing that what's immediate in our eyes goes far beyond this is not just for this moment this expands this is elasticity that we, it blows time out of the water Oh, I can't wait for that. <laughs> and in our world, seeing the intimations of the divine, we begin to feel the rush of the passing in the stillness of the eternal. Wow. That's an oxymoron. But if you can begin to grasp it, that's, in essence, what God is teaching us here. And it can't be comprehended by analysis. It doesn't mean that you've got to be a rocket scientist to get this understanding. Remember, God puts it on the lowest shelves so even the children can get the cookies. It's not beyond. He's not saying the bright, intelligent people will get it. He's saying the simple among you can grasp this because it's not by you. It's by entering into the spiritual sense that God has given us. This is the awe of God. And it's the beginning of wisdom. That's from a Psalm, I believe, Psalm 111 and verse 10. Yeah, the awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. Remember we talked about wisdom last week. We said the beginning of wisdom, acquire wisdom. That's what rests in the heart. Remember the heart's got to be connected. It's, it's all the beating and the, the, the bringing together. And with that, get understanding. That was Proverbs 14, 33. That, also Proverbs 4, 7 that we talked about last week. And we saw that we looked to Yahweh to James chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And that God would give freely to anyone everything that they need. It is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the mind. It is a matter of the soul. It is a matter of the spirit. It is all in relation. And God is bringing us up to this higher level where, wow, the crescendo of what we see, how it changes everything. And it starts by changing us. That's amazing. That's amazing. So we're seeing this fear, this awesome fear, is linked with seeing that the two were united, that it elevates us into a reverent awareness, a genuine communion with God. We've slipped off of the earth and into the, the sphere of the spiritual. This is where God lifts us up. This is how you're above your circumstances and not beneath. This is where your burdens and your trials and your troubles literally are stepping stones bringing you up closer to God. It's not to bend you down to the earth. It's to bring you up. And when you get into this, this is what God does. And in that, as we come closer to Him, it creates within us a spiritual antipathy toward evil. We don't want to participate with evil. We don't want to do evil. We, we're abhorred by evil. I wonder sometimes how long suffering the heart of God can be to this evil that is running rampant on the face of his creation that he created for our pleasure with him and is being so destroyed at the moment, not utterly because God is in control. But with all of this backdrop, with all of this understanding, going back now into chapter 10 and verse 12, what does it mean here in that verse, this key verse, that we're to fear the Lord your God? What is he saying? How are we to fear him? Are we to be, we're the children of Israel, to be threatened by those punishments and by those curses? Was that what it was? Or was it an awe 
a reverence, a majesty. Look at my power. Look at my presence. Look at who I am, and I want communion with you. And I'll guarantee you, the way you answer that question, what does this fear mean? That will tell you how you'll live out the rest of that verse. How you will walk. How you will love. How you will serve. The secret is getting into the divine. Being in that divine realm. Being in that awesomeness. Letting your mind be blown. Letting God take over. And letting him minister to you. Speak to you. Tell you. Deter you from sin because you'll have no pleasure in it. You won't want to be a part of it. You won't be headed down the path for the curses. You will be in the flow of his blessing. You'll be fed. You'll be watered. You'll be satiated. You'll be living on such a high spiritual note that the earthly things don't touch you in the same way. If you only look at it as a punishment to keep you in line, then you're only seeing it from that physical. And that's insufficient to see the spiritual life. You cannot see or judge the spiritual life on this physical. If you do, you can be like the Pharisees that, that Yeshua called out. You're whitewashed sepulchers. You look good on the outside. You cleaned up the outside. You want the outside to look good? Look at me, God. I've got big tefillin. I'm going to say big prayers. And I'm bowing down before you and doing all the external. God said, but inside, you're dead man's bones. Look, boy. And I think again in Jeremiah 17, 9, with which we talked about last week, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Those who are in that, who are cleaning up the outside, who are doing it all in their power and showing God how great they are, they are missing the side that's God's salvation. Do you realize it's God's salvation? <clears throat> That's expressed in the love of Messiah. It's in his mercy that he drew us. That's what it says, that in his mercy he drew us. In his chesed, in his everlasting love, in his kindness, he drew us. And Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, to our people Israel, that we can apply to ourselves because we are his people also when we come into faith through Messiah. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. Therefore, in essence, I draw, draw you to me. Let me tell you what that word draw means. I love it. I love it. You just think of this gentle little lady. That's not what it means. <laughs> this word in, in Hebrew, meshach, means to seize, to drag away. He is so desirous of you that he's ready to grab you and seize you and snatch you away and pull you out of that cesspool of sin and disgust and bring you. Pull you out of the fire. Put the fire within and light you on fire so that you spread his light. That's what it does. That's the Shekinah glory of God. That's God's chesed. He seizes us. He takes us captive and he leads us as our Savior. That's I want to be his slave. Yeah. I absolutely want to be his slave. And in the same, from the Hebrew to the Greek, when we go to Yochanan, John 6, 44, it says, no one's able to come to me unless he's dragged away by the Father. Do you know how much he wants you? He's willing to grab you by the hand and drag you away. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to let you. <laughs> if you're feeling him drag you, <laughs> pick up your feet and go, <laughs> okay? He brings us to that point. This is the divine act of the creation of God. This is understanding the mission of Yeshua. Yeshua came with a mission. He had a plan. He had a purpose. It wasn't for everything. He had a single-mindedness, and it's the highest sense of reverence and of awe when we can grasp hold of this. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the cross. And it's at the cross that grace, chesed, mercy, that graciousness, and truth met. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's where righteousness and shalom, peace, can kiss. That's Psalm to Helene 85, either 10 or 11, depending on the version you're in. Can you imagine righteousness? 
closeness and peace kissing. Wow. And it happens at the cross. The prayer verses in Tehillim in Psalm 86, the, the psalmist is saying, show us your mercy. Show us your grace. Show us your chesed. Grant us your salvation. Grant us Yeshua. And then the next verse says, his salvation is near. And then when we take it past that near, we see at the cross. That's where it met. That's where we see both God's fearful wrath against sin and at the same time, his awesome love. I got three. <laughs> three. <laughs> to see that, to see both sides of that, God's wrath for sin at the nailing of the cross, which is the greatest picture of love and of mercy and of grace that was carried out for us. Oh. Go into our half Torah portion. With that in mind, as you're looking at it, Yeshua, Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. <laughs> Can a woman forget her child at her breast? Can she not, not show pity on a child from her womb? Now, this has always been a beautiful picture. But those of you who know me in my personal life know that I have a niece slash daughter who has a four-month-old. She would do anything for that precious little soul that suckles at her breast. She watches her whole schedule around that little guy. So she feeds him when he wants to be fed, and she nurtures him, and she loves him, and smiles, and the giggles between the two of them already is so precious. I don't know your relationship and what you've had and what you've experienced in your life. Take it off of the physical level and go into the spiritual and picture your Father in heaven loving you in that kind of way. The look, the care, the love. By the way, the Lord calls himself merciful and gracious, Rahum Bethanu. Now the noun form of Rahum is Rechum. You know what Rechum is? Womb. Womb. You're in God's womb. You are loved in that. That's God's compassion, greater and deeper than that mama's love for her child. Could she forget that child? A good chance. Could God forget you? Not a chance. Is that not beautiful? And yet, don't stop there. That's verse 15. Now go into verse 16. I love it. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. And I wish I had brought you a mentor. I have a little statue. And it's a hand and it's a person leaning into that hand. And on the bottom it says this verse. I'll show you next week. I'll bring it in. Engraved. Etched. Inscribed. I looked up inscribed. It's marked with characters. You know what characters marked God inscribing, etching, engraving? The tools he used? Nails. Nails. On the palm of his hand where he etched your The love of the mama to her baby could only be superseded by seeing that love, that love, that sacrifice of Yeshua that reconciles us with God by exchanging the judgment we deserve for our sin with the righteousness of our Messiah. He's etched us permanently in the palm of his hand. And when we know that reconciles us, reconcile means to exchange one thing for another. <coughs> Yeshua, the sin bearer, through his better blood, put that blood on the holy of holies in heaven to open up all of heaven 
that you can come right into the presence of this living God. If that's not love, what is? And I'd love to say he pinned back the curtain of heaven with nails and is held in place forever, forever. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. So that judgment made against your sin at the foot of the cross declares your righteousness. That's why righteousness and shalom could kiss. They met at the cross. That's the divine exchange in my heart. Just says, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just praise our God in Messiah. We become literally a new creation. And in that new creation, now we have the power to walk worthy. We couldn't do it before. We were the caterpillar. We were bound to the ground. Now we're the butterfly that's free to fly to the heavens, to be in the presence of our God, to have him working in us, to change us, to mold us, to make us in his image. And the picture that we see, even with our law, we see the first tablets that were given to us, that Moshe took, God wrote, he came down the mountain, they had already broken them, and he broke them. That we see was given to us on the basis of God's justice, on the basis of God's holiness, he gave us those first set of commandments. And then God gave Moshe a second set, didn't he? Made him bring up the tablet, it was a whole different scenario. But you know what he did with that second set? He gave that to Moshe to give to the people, to give to us, out of his grace and out of his mercy. Not out of the justice and the holiness, but now out of his grace and his love. Because they'd already sinned. They already needed to suffer the consequences. They'd already broken them. But here, God met Moshe. And God showed him. Moshe pleaded for that. Yes, he pleaded going to the Holy Land, but not in the same way that he pleaded with God before the people. He told the people, I'm going to go to God. I don't know if we can be forgiven for this. I don't know if it's all over. The deal is off the table. And he fled. Forty days he spent on that mountain talking to God, pleading with God. And God's answer was, out of my grace, out of my mercy, I will give you. And he gives this second set. Moshe, representing the law, could not go into the promised land. But Yahshua, representing the grace, whose name even means God saves, is the one who could bring them into the promised land. What a picture God has been drawing for us. And at the time that he gives Moshe that, that second set, How can I, how can I, this is the ocean in the teacup. This is Shema, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Go read them. Thirteen attributes of God. His mercy, his loving kindness, his forgiveness for sin, for iniquity, for everything we need to be forgiven for. There's so much. I could take a year on those two verses and never cover or exhaust our God. That's where it changed in his mercy and in his grace. This, this is what sin blinds you to. Sin blinds you to the passion of your God that, that even makes you fear his retribution. So you want to hold God away and you're afraid to get near him. That's what Satan wants you to think. But remember, walk into that fear as an awe. Wow, God, what you did for me. Oh, brings you in close. It doesn't repel you. It doesn't send you away. It brings you in close. And you begin to see God's plan, his love that reaches down to you. And then you hear him say to Israel, who's rebellious enough, she's going to go into captivity. Yet in the midst of that, he says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, Israel, I have a plan for you. And it's a plan for future. It's a plan for a hope. It's not to leave you in captivity. Oh, what does the Lord require of us? The fear of the Lord, Yerat Hashem, 
now the beginning in that wisdom now walk in his ways and with that all with that will come obedience with that will come our desire to want what god wants for us because that's the best for us and the response will be that we will love him how can you not love a god who loves you so you grasp that love what does your heart do oh it responds it wants to reach out and wrap our arms around the lord and just Fall is deep and just worship him and then realize we love him because he first loves us. First God, first Yahweh 4 19. And that motivation. Now you're getting that heartbeat again. Now you're at the matter of the heart that that's what matters. And that's how you walk worthy. Because God transforms the heart. He leads you to a circumcised heart. What a picture that is. Daughter room 10 and verse 16 in our parasha this week. It says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer hardened. How do you walk? How do you love? With a circumcised heart. When you have that circumcision, that thickening, that hard-heartedness, that stubborn, that stiff neck, that all of that, that unbelief, that's gone. That's cast out. That's missing. That's not in your promised land. That's beyond, behind. That's gone. Did he call Israel stiff-necked people? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Did they have the corner on the market? Yes. Absolutely not. <laughs> you Gentiles are just as stiff-necked. But he did call them stiff-necked. And the first time he did was, or I think the first time, first time I recall, is because of the golden calf, is because of what had taken place. Someone took in defying stiff neck, and I love it. Someone who mulishly refuses to move his head and listen, schma, to those who are trying to guide or help him. That's stiff neck. That's what they were doing. They were mulish. They were planting their feet. They weren't listening. They didn't have an ear to hear God. And they were in their foolish mulishness. They were pulling it apart. You know that neck? It just happens to be the corridor from the head to the heart. Remember how I said don't miss heaven by 18 inches? That's inflexible. That's a way of thinking that, that caused them to rebel, that caused them to entice a harem. Make this golden calf. It's what brought us out of Egypt. Really? You just created it out of junk. You call it gold. We walk on it in heaven. And this, you want to say, had the power? to drown the Egyptian army, to, to divide the Red Sea, to keep you from the fiery serpents, the scorpions, the, scorpions, the drought that, that fed you, Ma, that watered you from a rock. Really? This thing? Really? Oh, this is where I see God's long suffering and his patience and his grace, because I think at this point I would be wanting to say, <laughs> crispy critters, I'll start again with the new people. And then even though God threatened that, it's not what he, his intent. His intent was to show Moshe. His love that was unconditional. Oh, thank you, God, for your unconditional love. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That comes right out of a book called Hebrews. That is to the Hebrews. It can't get more Jewish than that. We can apply it whether we're Hebrew or whether we're Gentile. The chapter 3, is verses 7 and 15. And you know what's in between those? The reminder of their wilderness experiences. That's where it came from. They hardened their heart at that time in the wilderness. And God's saying, don't. He's saying, I'm stiff-necked. I'm so stiff-necked that I've got a stubborn love for my people. I'm not going to let them go. Tell him Psalm 103 and verse 8, Adonai is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace. Or another version, abounding in mercy. Hallelujah. I am so glad that he is so stiff-necked that he's determined to help me walk in his ways, that he is going to take my obstinacy, my stubbornness, and turn it to be devotion and to be strength. That's what happens when the heart gets circumcised. That's how it changes with that new spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh. Now we're able to be led into love, the love of God, 
And even it'll pour over into the love of those around us, even those who aren't lovely. It even works there. The heart of the flesh, lev echad, one heart, that's what changes. When God gives us a heart of flesh, we have his heart. That's how we have love for one another. That's being sensitized to our God. That's seeing his love for us. And when we are that love, then we can exude that love to others. But we've got to know we're that love first. That's when you're able to detect, even in the slightest, most minute details, oh, this is the hand of God in my life. And forgive us, Lord, when we say, and I hear it so often, how could God do that to me? How could God allow this? How could God, and we blame him for everything. You might be blaming him for your greatest blessing because that's what he's meaning it for, is to be a blessing in your life, to draw you in, to bring you into that love that you will now be able to love him with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, and with your whole being. There was a little guy, I think I've told the story before, forgive me for repeating, a little guy back in Chicago. It's where uh, Moody had his church, big church. This little guy was in a very poor neighborhood. If he got to eat that day, he was rich that day. He didn't have much. He snuck into the back of that church, and he listened to that sermon that day. And his heart loved the Lord. And that offering plate went by. He understood what that meant. He had literally nothing to give. And he watched that offering plate go by. And he watched as the whole procedure took place. What no one knew was what was taking place inside of him. And his little heart was broken. I don't have anything I can give you, God. He watched him take that offering plate and take it all the way down front and put it at the front, just in front of the pulpit. And suddenly something just came over him. And he got up and he went down that aisle. And he went to where that offering plate was and he picked it up off the table and he put it on the floor. And then he stepped inside. And he said, I give you all of me. Out of the mouth of babes. The commandments aren't meant to be rigid and fearful. They're meant to draw us into a right relationship. It's for our good. This is where we're to be learning. This is what we should learn from the children of Israel. Not a fear of God, but a love of God. Because He cares enough to command us. He cares enough to give us guidelines. He cares enough to be rigid and stiff-necked. And in this, now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you but to fear you, the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Traditional Judaism, it says that there's a personal response. There's an exercise of your will. I'll say that's right, because God did give us free will. Rashi said, when God asked Israel only to fear him, he backed up from his sovereign role so that they could have freedom to follow him, to be obedient, or to not. He said, God gave the soul a path of goodness that leads to blessings, and he gave the path of wickedness that leads to curses. And then the paradox of it all, because they're going to have to choose. They're going to be forced to choose. He backed up so that it wasn't his force on them, but he backed up so that they could choose. And they cannot choose to not choose. You choose. You do one or the other. You can't live in limbo. You do one or the other. And ultimately, that choice determines how God and your relationship with, with God will be and how you will see everything and how you will do everything in your life. That's that verse in action. And it doesn't come because God forces, but he gives that freedom to choose. Delivering 10 and verse 20, I've done verse 12 heavily. 
20 that I quoted to you earlier says, you're to fear God and I, your God, you're to serve him. And then the key word in there is to cling to him. Cling in our Hebrew is the bach. To cling, to cleave, to keep close, it refers to a communion. It's not something that can be separate. We're used to the word cleave in a right way. A man leaves and cleaves to his wife. He leaves his father and mother, he cleaves to his wife so that they become the song, the chah, one heart, one spirit. They're one together, one flesh. Do you know Yav, Yav Job, in chapter 19 and verse 20, he said his bones cling to his skin or his flesh. Can you separate the bones and the skin? Not successfully, not without a bloody mess. <laughs> That's how close. God wants to be so close with you. He wants you to cleave to him, be united with him. And he says, I'm already cleaving with you. He first loved us. He didn't leave it for us. And then he responds. He does it. And then we respond. Yes, Yahweh, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be distressed, for I am your God. I give you strength. I give you help. I support you with my victorious right hand. And let me take you fast into the Hebrew. I'm going to just hit the highlights. In that verse, fear not, is our word yareh. The same word. That same, that reverential fear rather than that oh, I'm afraid. I am. And we can read into that. It's not, but we can read into it. He is the great I am. And you can go with that one. But he says here, I am with you. That's to be understood. He's already there. You know when he told Noah to get into the ark? He was already in the ark. He didn't say, you go in and then I'll follow. He said, come into him. He's already there. He's already with us. Then he says, don't be distressed. In our Hebrew is don't be sha'ah. Don't gaze away. And I thought, wow. When we look in his face, we're there. When we look away, what happens? Keep up. Walking on the water as long as he looked at Yeshua. But the moment he looked at the waves, the moment he looked at the circumstances, the moment he looked at what was around him, he said, that realized the Lord was there. He was with him and pulled him up. But that's what is saying to you in that verse. The fear not. I am with you. Don't look away. Don't gaze away. Don't be distracted. I will talk. I will support you. I will grasp you. I will hold fast. Remember that holding on to the heel? I will hold fast. And I will hold you with my right hand. Yami. That etched, nail scarred hand. That divine exchange. Our sins for his righteousness. The new creation. We're no longer the caterpillar, we're that butterfly, we're together with him. That's practicing the presence of our God, grasping hold of him in our daily life. And realizing he's grasped hold of us. He's already got us. We're holding on for dear life. You don't need to. There's no fear. He's keeping you and he will keep you always. That's beginning to see the awesomeness of the creator God who created you for this communion with him. That's the eye of faith. That's not seeing with those physical eyes. That's the eye of faith and that's remembering your circumstances, God's already there. Good, bad, or ugly. He's already there. Dabarim, Deuteronomy 7.21, don't be frightened. Don't be terrified. Adonai is there with you in your midst. And when we are truly surrounded by the presence of our God, we realize nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I take you to Romans 8, 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, rulers, nor things present now, nor things that are to come, nor any kind of powers, not height, not depth, not any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. And where does that love come from? That is in, and let me give it to you in our Jewish vernacular, which is the original, that comes to us through Messiah Yeshua. 
that's Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah, the Anointed One, who is God. In that love, where it all came together at the foot of the cross, what have you to fear? What? Said the robin to the sparrow. I should really like to know why those anxious humans rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Isaiah, Yeshia 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Approach him in the awe and the wonder, and walk in the awe of God's ways, and you will love him and serve the Lord your God with your whole heart your whole soul, mind, and your whole soul. And you will see this parasha is living, the living word of the Holy God who loves you so. Hallelujah.